So I am psyched to be here with y'all. Um, the Finger Lakes Trail is so near and dear to my heart. Um, I had an amazing journey while I was uh, hiking across it and, and up from it and down from it <laughs> on branch trails. Um, and as I was talking with, with Christy earlier, I really owe it to the Finger Lakes Trail community for making that hike a success. I mean, there were so many people that helped me along the way and I certainly could not have could not have been successful in my my goal of hiking all those miles on the trail without without y'all. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to share with you about the plants and I chose this topic. I mean, obviously the Finger Lakes Trail, but uh, I thought for me, getting to know the plants has opened up a whole nother um, aspect of, of hiking for me. You know, I walk down the trail, it's no longer a green tunnel. Um, years ago when I hiked the Appalachian Trail, and we're going back about 13 years now, I didn't know the plants very well. I yearned to know them, but I didn't. And it was very much a green tunnel. And after I um, got my certificate in herbal medicine and walked with a number of experts and really started studying, you know, my next so many long distance trails were just like, it was like a treasure hunt, you know, like everywhere I turned, there were these valuable plants and beautiful plants. And I knew each one by name and it just changes the whole experience. Um, so I hope that I can give you a little window into our edible and medicinal plants tonight and uh, enhance your hiking experience. So I'm going to do my best here to get my slideshow up. Let's see. And what we're going to do, we're going to go through roughly 10 plants that you can find on the Finger Lakes Trail. Oh, we're back at the end again. Sneak peek. I don't know how that happens. Pardon me, guys. I wish I knew how they just jumped to the start. Um, so we are going to go through 10 plants that you can find on the FLT, but these plants certainly could be found um, in your own backyard, on other trails that you regularly frequent. Um, these are common wild edible and medicinal plants. And they also purposely chose plants that are hard to confuse with those things that are, um, are toxic or that you would not want to be ingesting. Um, so these are fairly easy to recognize and easy to discern from those toxic plants. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how you can use them, um, either on the trail or at home and, and their identifying characteristics. So we are gonna have a chance for questions, I understand, at the end but you can uh, punch in your questions there in the chat um, so we make sure we can, can get to as many as possible. We'll get started. So the first plant you might find is violet, scientific name, viola. And anytime you see SPP, that means that I'm referring to multiple species of viola. Um, so Viola, the parts that we're using are the leaves and or the flowers. And you can see the flowers of violet are five petaled and what we call irregular. So irregular flowers are those that do not have radial symmetry uh, and all of their petals are not equal in size, shape and color. So you can see they're nearly the same, um, same shape and, and color size, but not quite. Um, now, Viola can take on a number of, of appearances, so depending on what species you're working with. What we're looking at here is the marsh blue violet, Viola cuculata, but here's an example of some other violets. So here's the Canadian violet on the left, and that is one I certainly saw a lot of on the Finger Lakes Trail, and then we have the common violet on the right, so Viola sororia. Viola canadensis and Viola sororia. Um, now, as far as eating violets for food, you can use any that are purple, blue, white, 
or a combination thereof. So these three violets that I've shown you already would be perfectly safe. Um, and there are many other species too that are those colors. There are actually just a handful of yellow violets that you may find on the Finger Lakes Trail. Now, they are not known to be toxic, but some people have reported that they can cause nausea. So that's why I want to encourage you to stick to those that are not yellow. Um, so violets, let me take you back here. You're going to be finding them, again, depending on the species in different places. But typically, they do like partial shade. They do like moist soil. Um, and you can find them along the edges of grassy trail. You can find them dotting your lawn if it's a shaded lawn. Um, you can find them growing amidst rocks even on the, on the Finger Lakes Trail. So they are, are pretty diverse. Um, species like the Canadian violet, you are typically going to find just on, on trail in the woods, whereas something like the common violet is more apt to pop up on your lawn. So different species do prefer different areas. But as far as what we can eat or use medicinally, those flowers you can pop right off the top, um, pop in your mouth, depending upon the species, they're going to have a sweet flavor or a spicy flavor, maybe even minty. Um, so it can be kind of fun to walk along and, and sample, see what your community of violets tastes like. Um, those also make nice toppers, you know, to pasta or salads. Um, decorative toppers for cakes, things like that. So lots of ways in which you can just get creative with these beautiful flowers. And the leaves too of violet, which can take on a variety of appearances too, um, these are also edible. So you can eat violet leaves just like you would spinach. Um, have them raw in the salad. You can wilt them in pasta or rice or stir fries. You could even blend them up into a pesto if you wanted to. And what I love about violet leaves is that they are so versatile and they never are bitter. Um, so a lot of our wild greens, once the plant has flowered, um, will, grow, will grow bitter. That never happens with violet. The leaves will grow more tough as the season goes on. And so that's the time when you, when you cook with them instead of eating them raw. Now, your violet leaves, they are also helpful in discerning that you, you truly have a violet. So your violet leaves are typically going to be heart-shaped. So that violet leaf you see on the left-hand side, that is more often than not what you're gonna see with violets. A heart-shaped leaf with tiny little teeth along the outer edge. Now, the one on the right, that's kind of the oddball. So that's the early blue violets or viola palmata. So that is the only one that I'm aware of that's going to have those um, really deep lobes. Sometimes violet will have spoon-shaped leaves as well. And most often than not, your violet leaves are going to arise only from the base of the plant. So they'll be in a sort of basal rosette. Um, and then you'll have these long stems that arise from that basal rosette, with just a single flower atop each stem. Um, now, the Canadian violet is the exception to that rule. So the Canadian violet is going to have uh, stem leaves as well that are alternate. Um, but again, if you're concerned about being certain that you've got a true violet and not something else, stick with those that have just the basal heart-shaped leaves um, and you should, you should be fine. Um, the reason why I also specified one flower top each stem is because there are um, other pretty purple flowers like, um, uh, let's see, delphinium, monk's hood, uh, that would have multiple flowers to a flowering stalk. And those are toxic, so you would not want to make that mistake. Um, they could also be growing in similar habitats. Now, medicinally, the leaves of violet, uh, they are astringent and also mucilaginous. And mucilaginous basically just means they're going to get slimy when wet. Um, so both astringency and that mucilaginous quality are really excellent uh, for anti-inflammatory purposes. So this is a leaf, too, you could crush up and apply to itchy bug bites. You could make a strong tea out of just by steeping in hot water and use, a soap, use as a soak for poison ivy. You could also ingest this tea of leaves 
internally too for a sore throat or digestive upset. Um, so violet leaves, they're a great, you know, all purpose first aid on the trail as well as something that's just so easy to, to toss into a trail meal or even something at home. Ah, there's an example of how you could use your violet flowers as a topper for deviled eggs. <laughs> and that too is a common blue violet. So common blue violets, they can be blue, they can be white purely, which is very, uh, you know, that common name can be deceiving, or they can be blue and, and white together, so. So our next plant, chickweed, Scientific names Stellaria media and Stellaria pubera. Now Stellaria media is the common chickweed. Stellaria pubera is the uh, great chickweed or great star chickweed. Um, these are two chickweeds that you will readily find on the FLT. Uh, sometimes they'll grow in similar habitats, but they do kind of have their own places. So your common chickweed, which is what we're looking at here right now, um, that one you will find in, it'll somewhat grow in a mat. It won't grow real erect. It'll kind of trail. And you'll find that on the edges of streams, um, edges of trail, along the base of trees as well. Um, and you may find it growing on your lawn or along the edge of your garden too. So this is certainly one that you'll find in civilization. Um, the Stellaria pubera, or the great chickweed, as its name implies, does grow taller. Um, it grows straight up, and it does tend to have a larger flower. So this is your great chickweed. This one I typically find only in forest settings. Uh, it is also more tolerant of sun, so you may find it more in full sun, whereas the common chickweed is going to like more shady areas. Now, chickweed is definitely one of the first things to pop up in spring. Um, it needs those cool temperatures to flower. Uh, for that reason, you'll sometimes see it in the fall as well. Now, chickweed, what we're using is the whole above ground plant. So that includes the leaves, the stems, the flowers. And this is one of my favorite um, trailside nibbles just because it is so delicious. It does never grow, it never grows bitter. And it has a sweet, crisp, uh, uh, kind of corn-like flavor. So it's a lovely addition to salads. You could layer it in sandwiches. Um, just a, a delight. Another one you could blend into a pesto if you wanted to. And chickweed, like violet, um, is going to be very cooling to inflammation. So you could certainly uh, mash this up or uh, make what's called a spit and chew poultice, which is where you literally just chew up the plant and mix it with some saliva and then apply it to your, your bug bites or your swollen red area there. Um, and it will reduce the inflammation. It'll cool itching. Um, and on a side note too, chickweed, you know, it's, it was really appreciated by uh, folks down in southern Appalachia, it would be, um, as I said, one of the first greens that would appear in spring, and it was, it was valued and considered a blood cleanser, too. So what that means, we could kind of equate blood cleanser with uh, what we would call detoxifiers nowadays. So it's an herb that we consider, you know, in, in reinvigorating the body, reducing stagnancy, um, basically enlivening the body. And there is some science to back that up. Chickweed contains something called steroidal saponins, which literally increase the um, ability of our glands, our endocrine system, to absorb and assimilate nutrients from the food we eat. So you're, it's really a very nutritious plant. Um, also high in vitamin A and K and C. But, yeah, chick. Wait, I'm so I'm not used to not being able to hear people's questions while I'm talking. <laughs> this is unusual. Um, so here's an example of what your your harvest might look like. So your violet leaves, you could just pinch those right from the base of the plant, 
And your chickweed, you could either take a scissor to the base of the plants or you could, um, you know, pinch that off as well. And what we're looking at here is the great chickweed. So you can see that's a pretty substantial looking plant. Um, your common chickweed is, is going to be significantly smaller. Dame's Rocket, scientific name Hesperus matronalis. Uh, Dame's Rocket is a mustard, and you've probably heard of eating creasy greens or, um, you know, just wild mustard greens. You know, Dame's Rocket is another one that you could be using that way. Um, we just don't hear much about it for one reason or another. It is uh, non-native. It is native to Europe but it is certainly naturalized uh, throughout our landscape. You can find it um, you know, growing in the spring along uh, grassy embankments, roadside. I saw a lot of Dame's Rocket around um, shaded areas around ponds and streams on the Finger Lakes Trail. Uh, this is very, very common and one too that is sometimes in wildflower mixes. That's partly how it has spread and naturalized in our landscape is people planting it and just not realizing that they're planting a non-native. But Dane's Rocket will grow roughly, oh, I'd say about two and a half feet tall at maturity. And it has these flowers that are about an inch, I'd say, across, four petaled, and in a literal cross kind of arrangement. And that is very typical for any mustard family plant. Uh, your leaves, are going to be alternate on the stem. So when I say alternate, I mean not in pairs, not directly across from one another on the stem. Um, and here on the left, you've got a white Dame's Rocket. So Dame's Rocket can be that sort of pink or fuchsia color we just saw, or white. And you can sometimes have two different colored flowers actually growing on the same plant. So kind of wild. Now, the reason why I'm specifying alternate leaves is because phlox, which can look very much like this, will have opposite leaves, and we don't want to confuse this with phlox. Um, also, phlox will have five petaled flowers, not four, but besides those two identifiers, they can look very much the same, and they certainly can grow in the same habitat. So Dame's Rocket, those flowers are edible, and they've got a spicy, little hint of bitter sort of flavor. And the leaves, which you can just pluck right from the stem, are, um, they very much resemble, or they very much um, are reminiscent of arugula. So they've got a, a spicy kind of, they've got a heat to them, but not, not overpowering. And those leaves that are closest to the flowers that are located terminally on the plant are going to be tastiest and most tender. Um, so as those leaves get bigger going down the stalk, they're gonna get tougher and, and you may have a greater bitter quality. But you can eat these leaves raw. You can, again, wilt them in stir fries, um, add them to soups if you'd like. So just get creative and, and I would treat them like you know, like you would in arugula, basically. The wood sorrel, scientific name Oxalis. We have several species of Oxalis. All of them are edible and like chickweed or like the different species of violet, different species will grow in different habitats. They each have their preferred habitat. So the wood sorrel that we're looking at here is the common wood sorrel. Let me give you an idea of what that flower looks like. So the common wood sorrel is that flower on the right, which uh, funnily enough, uh, not the most common wood sorrel <laughs> that you'll come across. I feel you are much more apt to come across the yellow wood sorrel on the left-hand side of the screen there. Um, but your common wood sorrel is, is going to be in the woods. It's going to be um, in mossy patches, at the base of the trees, uh, hidden between rocks, along grassy trail. Um, I did see a lot of common wood sorrel 
on the FLT, but it's not something you, you see everywhere. Um, that yellow wood sorrel, that is one that you will readily find on your lawn, popping up in your garden, um, you know, grassy areas in a park or generally a more civilized area. Um, not saying that you couldn't find it in the woods, but um, definitely one that, that enjoys civilization. And all of our other wood sorrels that we have in our region are going to be yellow. So that common wood sorrel is the unusual one. Now, if we were heading down south or something, Florida has, uh, has fuchsia ones. But um, here we just have the yellow and the striped. So wood sorrel, the leaves and the flowers, basically the whole above ground plant, are edible uh, and very tasty. They have a lemony, citrusy sort of flavor about them. Um, so I love just tossing these in salads, um, eating them as I go as a sort of trail side nibble. Um, they're rich in vitamin C. They do have a mild diuretic quality. And you could also uh, add these two teas, steeping them in hot water. Say you like a green tea or a chamomile tea and you want a little accent of lemon. By all means, use some wood sorrel. My only caution is if you uh, have a propensity towards kidney stones, be cautious in how much wood sorrel you're ingesting because it does contain oxalic acid, um, which could potentially contribute to kidney stones. So um, just be mindful, you know, don't be making strong, strong cups of tea of just wood sorrel. A little nibble here and there certainly is not going to hurt you, but um, don't make it a, an everyday food if you have a propensity towards kidney stones. And let me just take you back to that leaf again. So wood sorrel, this is a plant too that a lot of people will confuse with clover, understandably so. So clover, and, and we call this, you know, typically this is where our four leaf clover gets its shape from. Um, but clover has oval leaflets, not heart-shaped leaflets. So here you can see those leaflets and what we're looking at is actually one leaf divided into three leaflets. Um, those leaflets have a very strong crease down the center. Um, your clovers will be oval shaped and they may still be creased but they will be oval. They will not have that little indentation, that notch at the top. And clover, we do not consume the same way as wood sorrel. So who knows this plant, huh? <laughs> Nettles, scientific name La Portea canadensis and Urtica dioca. So, there are two different plants that we do consider nettles, and, and actually there's several species that we would consider nettles, but these are the ones that you are most apt to encounter um, on a regular basis and also on the Finger Lakes Trail. And I must say, if the Finger Lakes Trail had its own official plant, nettles might be it. <laughs> a lot of nettles that I encountered on the trail. Um, but they were much appreciated because they are so useful. So um, nettles, also called stinging nettles, and for good, for good reason, let me skip you up ahead just a little bit. We call this plant stinging nettles because the entire plant is covered with these tiny translucent hairs that are very sharp. And at the base of each of those hairs is a little bulb of fluid that contains a cocktail of uh, histamines, um, also neurotransmitters, serotonin. Um, but what happens when we brush by this plant is those fine little hairs uh, break the surface of our skin and just like a hypodermic needle, inject that little bulb of fluid up the hair follicle and into your bloodstream. So it causes this itching, burning sensation, but thankfully only temporarily. Um, and it's not like poison ivy where it's going to worsen 
and you're going to have a, a obvious rash on your skin. Um, oftentimes, nettles leave no rash whatsoever. You aren't even aware that you pass them until you start to feel that kind of burning sensation. And, and I would liken it to um, a mosquito bite or like a very mild bee sting. You kind of get that like shivery, hot, cold feeling um, where you've brushed against that plant. Uh, sometimes you'll get tiny little welts. Um, but believe it or not, this plant that sounds somewhat vicious is entirely edible and delicious. Um, now you're not going to be eating this plant raw. You're going to be cooking it. So let me take you back to that first picture. Uh, so on your uh, La Pertea canadensis, which is what I would call wood nettle, or your Urtica dioca, which is commonly called stinging nettle, what you're gonna be eating are the leaves. And you can harvest those leaves anytime before the plant has flowered. Once the plant has flowered, the leaves are going to get a little bit tougher and their medicinal qualities are going to get a little bit stronger. Now I have eaten leaves past the time of flowering and I have had no negative um, side effects. However, traditionally, people did not eat the leaves uh, after the plant has flowered. Um, if you had a kidney condition, because this plant is a diuretic, it could be aggravating after the plant has flowered. Um, so use your own judgment that way. But you've got a good window in spring before those, those flowers appear. So the leaves, what you're gonna do is very carefully just pinch those from the stalk. Now, a couple different ways you can do that. The safest way is to don a pair of heavy duty gardening gloves so those hairs don't, don't reach your skin. Um, you could use a scissor and snip them. Or if you're on the trail and you don't happen to have either of those things with you, you can just pluck with confidence. <laughs> and sometimes they will not sting you. I have been stung by nettles dozens, if not hundreds of times. Um, it's not that bad. Um, it depends on how, how badly you want those nettles. <laughs> um, but once you pluck them from the stalk, you are going to either saute, boil, or steam them. And within a minute's time, those hairs are just going to uh, degrade and dissolve, and they are not going to have any stinging quality anymore. Uh, nettles are high in vitamin A, K, C, potassium, a little bit of iron as well. Um, so they are very nutrient rich and like violet leaves, they're very versatile. Um, they are not bitter. Uh, they very much could be used like a spinach or like a kale. In fact, I would say their flavor is even more mild than, than kale is. Um, so I will often combine nettles uh, in pasta dishes and rice dishes with scrambled eggs and stews. Um, I've even seen folks like bake them into croissants. So you can really get creative with your nettles. Um, those leaves you can also make a tea of just by steeping them in hot water. Now this is where our two different species come into play. So La Portea canadensis, which is what I call wood nettle, that's our native nettle. And that one you're gonna find uh, deep in the woods, um, along streams, springs, likes damp, damp soil. You can also find it, you know, roadside, if, if roadside woods. But it is definitely um, an inhabitant of forests. Now your stingy nettle, your Urtica dioca, this is your European variety of nettle, and it is not it's not native to here, but it is naturalized. This one you're gonna find more in human disturbed habitats. So I typically find the European nettle um, along creeks, rivers, you know, places where there's been human, human commerce or, or literally human footsteps, <laughs> um, old home sites, old gardens. That's more where you're apt to find the European stinging nettle. Um, 
Now your European stingy nettle is the one that has um, a history of use medic medicinally um, as a strong diuretic. So we know this one has a diuretic effect. It's been studied. Um, it also can have an anti-inflammatory and antihistamine effect on the body. So the best way to get those benefits um, are by having that as a tea, but you could certainly also use this as a food, just incorporate it into your diet. The way that you're gonna discern the European stinging nettle from our native wood nettle is by its opposite leaves. So this picture here, you can see those leaves the stems of the leaves, the petioles, are directly across from one another. And what you're seeing uh, kind of springing forth from that stalk there are the, the flowers of nettle. Now your wood nettle, or your native variety, is going to have alternate leaves. And those leaves are more egg-shaped too. They're not quite as narrow as those of the European variety. Now, I have certainly made tea out of wood nettle before. It is tasty, it is bright green, um, and I have felt that it has a diuretic quality, so I suspect that this nettle too um, is just as medicinal as the European variety, but we just don't know for sure. So um, if we were to lump these into two categories, I would think of wood nettle as your food nettle and stinging nettle or the European variety as your, um, as your medicinal nettle. Now both of these plants uh, have an interesting history that um, they have been used in self-flagellation. So again, uh, folks down in the Appalachian Hills uh, used to use this plant to rid themselves of their arthritic pain. So they would literally take a nettle plant and uh, hit them, hit their achy joints with it or rub the leaves onto their achy joints and it was said that it would relieve um, aches and pains. I have as a backpacker tried this. <laughs> um, I can't say that it took away all my aches and pains. Um, I was thoroughly distracted from the initial aches and pains I had. Um, but it can act as an anti-inflammatory. Um, and it's thought that, you know, rubbing it into the joints, it's basically acting like a catalyst for your, for your body's own anti-inflammatory process. So kind of interesting there. Uh, so nettle, I'm not encouraging you to rub it onto your joints, just wanted you to be aware, <laughs> but a great food and tea plant. And here's a picture too. This is um, the European variety of nettle on the left hand side, just picked from the plant. And then on the right hand side is some wood nettle tea. Um, so you can see that brilliant green that it creates. Jewelweed. So I thought this would be an appropriate one to bring after the nettle. Um, I saw a lot of nettle on the Finger Lakes Trail, but Mother Nature does provide. Uh, the trail provides too. So with my, my large uh, uh, carpets of wood nettle, it seemed that jewelweed would come shortly thereafter or sometimes be mingled in with the wood nettle. And jewelweed is definitely our remedy for, um, for poison ivy, for dermatitis, for general itchiness of tissue. Um, so jewelweed, scientific name, Impatiens capensis, and there's also Impatiens pallida. Um, so two different species of Impatiens. And the reason why we call this jewelweed, this picture illustrates it, uh, after a rain, you will see that the, the beads of, of moisture there will just, they'll just hang onto the lobes of the leaves. Um, so it looks like the plant is bejeweled or adorned in jewels. Now this is your impatience capensis, that orange um, 
red speckled flower. And then in Patience Pallida is the yellow one on the right hand side that may or may not have a red speckled throat. Um, but you can see there on the impatience pallida, these leaves, or not these leaves, these flowers have a little hook or a little spur at the end. So that too will help you to identify them. And like violets, they are an irregular flower. So not radially symmetrical. They kind of look like an open mouse. Now, jewelweed, well, you won't see the flowers in the spring. They will be coming up in uh, mid to, to late summer even. But the leaves, will certainly be popping up in the spring. Jewelweed is one of those unique plants in which the stalk starts off with opposite leaves and then the leaves become alternate as the plant matures, so going up the stalk. So pretty unusual. Usually our plants either have opposite leaves or alternate leaves, not both. Um, but your leaves are gonna be egg-shaped with these rounded teeth along the outer margin. And it is the leaves and the stems that we are going to use topically if we're suffering from uh, a nettle sting or a poison ivy rash. Um, what we're after is basically the juice that is, is within. So you're gonna find the most juice at the nodes, which is where the leaves attach to the stem. And it's gonna kind of be like a, a nodular, um, kind of swollen area there. So, crush the stems there at the nodes and it's going to exude a juice and then you can rub that directly onto the skin. Um, you can certainly also mash up the leaves and the whole stem. You basically just want to get as much juice out of the plant as possible. Um, you could also take these leaves and stems and simmer them in a little bit of hot water or steep, that's fine too, and then strain off the plant parts and reserve the liquid uh, freeze those in ice cube trays, and then you've got yourself a nice bath if you really <laughs> stumbled into the poison ivy. Um, or you could just, you know, apply an ice cube too to that area. Uh, just make sure you label your ice cubes because jewelweed is toxic to ingest. So we're only using this topically. Never want to drink a tea of jewelweed. And jewelweed you're gonna find growing in damp areas too. So I saw it on damp trail, as I said, mingled in with, um, with nettle, with wood nettle. Um, but also you're gonna find it by streams and springs and seepage areas. And like wood nettle, uh, where you've got one jewelweed plant, you've usually got many. And I've also seen jewelweed very frequently growing with poison ivy. So kind of like it knows exactly where it may be needed. So here's one I'm sure many of you are familiar with, ramps as we call them down south or wild leeks, which is what I more often hear them called up here in, in the north. Um, scientific name is Allium trichocum, uh, and I included this one because it is more well known, it is so tasty, um, but I do want you to harvest this with the utmost caution um, because ramps are sometimes over harvested because they are so delicious and um, you know folks are eager to sell them at farmers markets or chefs are eager to use them in restaurants. But as a result, um, some of our ramp patches uh, have really suffered. Um, so if you're going to harvest ramps, um, please be mindful and I'll, I'll tell you the best method to, to do that. But first, let's talk about what our ramps look like in case you aren't familiar with this plant. So ramps are, they typically have two floppy basil leaves. Sometimes there's three. So when I say basil, I mean there is no uh, stalk that's bearing leaves. They are arising right from, from the ground. They have parallel veins, so these very smooth, almost imperceptible veins that travel vertically in the leaf. The stems are often red, although not always. And these leaves are pretty long. They'll be, I'd say about six to eight inches long. 
And like our wood nettle, like our jewelweed, usually when you've found a ramp, you've found lots of ramps. You've usually found a good, good sized patch. Um, and another reason why I really want to include ramps in this presentation was I have never seen so many ramps <laughs> as I did on the Finger Lakes Trail. Um, there are so many, um, sometimes carpets of them, but still, please be mindful um, of how many you, you are harvesting. You want to keep it that way. So your ramps, you're going to find in shaded woods, on cool embankments. Again, they do like damp soil. And I certainly saw ramps growing alongside um, wood nettle, jewelweed, that same sort of environment. Let's see what we've got here. Ah, so here's a, an idea of what a community of ramps may look like. We've got some uh, trout lily leaves popping up there too. Those are those speckled ones. They're edible as well. Um, but ramps, when you harvest these, they are a member of the onion family. So they do have a bulb at the base. But ramps can take um, up to seven years to reach maturity um, to the point where they are producing seed. They will also reproduce from the bulb and they are more apt to actually reproduce from the bulb, um, to sprout off more plants from that bulb. Um, so I encourage people not to harvest the bulb, leave that bulb be um, so that it can go on to sprout more plants, um, that plant can continue its life cycle, but rather just take a leaf, take one single leaf from a plant. Um, Take one leaf from one plant, another leaf from another plant, spread it out a little bit, and your leaves are oniony. They are delicious. You don't need to take the whole bulb. Um, now that said, if you want to take a, you know, a single bulb here or there just to try it, that's fine, but make sure you are taking from an abundant patch, not a patch where someone else has harvested. And if you're going to take the bulb, leave the little rootlets that sprout like a crown from the base of the bulb. Um, because it is possible that still could come back from that harvest. So if you use like a sharp knife and you slice that ball diagonally, you're leaving a little bit of it there. Um, however, again, the, the most sustainable way to harvest ramps is just going to be to take a leaf or two. Um, and with those leaves, what can we do with them? So um, ramps, with that oniony flavor, they go great with eggs. I love baking them up in quiches and I would, um, you know, just wilt them a little bit in the pan first and then combine them. Um, stir fries, soups, sandwiches. You can have them raw as well, but they do have a strong oniony flavor. And, you know, it's honestly a cross between onion and garlic to be more accurate. Um, you will, you will notice that smell when, when you pluck a leaf. Um, also, rams do make a great pesto, but you do have to harvest a, a good number of leaves in order to, to actually yield a, a good bit of pesto. So again, make sure you're, you're harvesting from an abundant patch. Um, and that oniony or garlicky smell, that's a major identifier too. There are other leaves in the forest that look like rams. But none other, no others have that, that aroma. So um, just pinch a leaf and stick your nose to it and you should smell it. If you don't smell it, you don't have ramps. And the other thing we're seeing on that quiche here, which uh, is not featured in the talk, but is purple dead nettles. So that's another little plant you could get to know. No relation to actual nettle. Now, garlic mustard, the scientific name Oliaria officinalis and Oliaria petiolata, two different species of the same genus. Um, garlic mustard is your alternative to ramps. So if ramps sounds delicious, but you just haven't stumbled across a patch yet, or you don't wanna be harvesting a plant where you have to be um, thinking so much about uh, sustainability, Garlic mustard, please, by all means, go pick your garlic mustard, pull it up by the roots. <laughs> this is an invasive plant, not native um, to North America, but it is all throughout our landscape. 
It inhabits woods, it inhabits lawns, it inhabits the edges of your property, and it too has a garlicky, oniony flavor that is distinctive and delicious. Um, so this you could have sprouting up on your lawn. What you're looking for are heart-shaped leaves that do somewhat resemble those of violet, but you can see um, the leaves are more rounded, typically at the tip. Uh, the Petiolata species will have more pointed tips, um, but Oliaria officinalis will have more rounded tips on those leaves. And you have a scalloped edge. So you've got rounded teeth instead of sharp teeth like you'd see on a violet leaf. Now garlic mustard is gonna start off as this basal rosette. Um, so it leaves, the leaves are arising directly from the ground and then it's gonna grow up a tall stalk in its second year of growth. And that stalk will be leafy and branching. And terminally, on those branches, you're gonna have what look like little broccoli florets. Um, this plant is related to broccoli, to kale. It's a member of the mustard family. And it actually has been eaten as a food for thousands of years. There's been fragments of garlic mustard found like in pottery from the BCE era. Um, so pretty incredible. Um, but those little broccoli looking florets are edible. You can pinch them off and eat them the same way you would broccoli. And they're my favorite part of this plant. Um, they're sweet, garlicky, um, substantial. You know, this is like a real vegetable, substantial vegetable. You can eat raw or cooked. And then the picture on the right hand side, that's what the flowers are going to look like when they open. They're small, they're white, they're four petaled. They're edible too, so a nice decorative piece. And garlic mustard, the whole plant, in fact, is edible. So those leaves, you can eat raw or cooked. You could eat the pliable stems. They can get a little tough as the plant matures, so that's why I say pliable. Um, and then even the root of garlic mustard, I'm not sure if I've got a photo. I don't think so. So even the root of garlic mustard um, is edible and it's like a horseradish and it's very easy to uproot so the complete opposite of like a dandelion you're just going to pull this plant up it's going to be a pencil thin short root and that you can um, grate or mince and use as a spice and here's a picture of um, some other ways you could use your garlic mustard so puree the leaves into a pesto toss them with some orzo pasta delish um, we've also got uh, some garlic mustard fritters here, along with dandelion fritters. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm, joke, I'm laughing at someone's little crack up there. Too old to cut the mustard. Um, <laughs> but your uh, garlic mustard flowers and your dandelion flowers, you could just drop in a batter and then drop in a frying pan and have yourself some fritters. Wild grape. This is another one that I just, I saw all along the Finger Lakes Trail. I don't think there was a day that I didn't encounter wild grape. Um, scientific name, Vitus. Um, multiple species. Doesn't really matter too much what species you have. Some species are going to have tougher leaves than others, um, but they are, they are all safe for consumption. Um, Wild grape, what you're looking for is a leaf that has a chordate base. So what I mean by that, it's like a heart-shaped base. And then you've got three to five uh, leaf, or three to five lobes that are toothed. Um, so you've got your, your major lobes, and then there's teeth all along the outer edge. And that is important because there's certainly a lot of other vines out there. Um, one I can think of in particular is moonseed, which would have that many lobes as well, but they would have a smooth edge, wouldn't have sharp little teeth. The wild grape is a vine that you're gonna find uh, twining around trees, fence posts, um, guardrails, um, signs, it clings. And it has these tendrils that help it do that, which you can see here in this picture. Um, but 
uh, wild grape leaves, when they first come out, when they first unfurl in the spring, they're very tasty, just raw. They're gonna have a lemony sort of flavor. There's an astringent quality to them. And this was one of my trail side creations. <laughs> so here we've got a cream cheese bagel with sun-dried tomatoes and grape leaves and tendrils. And those tendrils are nice and pliable too when they're younger. As they get older, they'll get more kind of cord-like, but you can eat, eat the leaves and tendrils and all. Um, and of course, our wild grape does produce edible fruits in the fall, um, but uh, we're focusing more on our, our springtime palate here. Uh, rich in vitamin C. Um, another plant I would not want you to confuse with wild grape would be um, bitter nightshade. So that one is toxic. It also produces um, blue-black fruits. Um, you do not want to make that mistake. Bitter Nightshade has an arrowhead shaped leaf. Ah, here we go. So as your grape leaves mature some, um, they make excellent wraps. You can use them um, like to make dolmas. Uh, and, and what I like to do is basically um, blanch them. So you know, cook them quickly, then throw them in an ice bath, and then um, can them with some lemon juice, salt, hot water, and then they'll be nice and tender when you go to use them later in the month or later in the season. Sweet fern, I think we've got two more plants. So the scientific name, Comptonia peregrina, um, and definitely get to know these plants by their scientific names because this is the perfect example of how our common names can be deceptive. So sweet fern is not a fern at all. <laughs> it is a member of the wax myrtle family. Uh, it's a shrub, a woody shrub. And like wax myrtle, the leaves are very fragrant. So this is a family of fragrant plants in general. Um, but sweet fern is a really common woody shrub that you're gonna encounter, uh, not only on the Finger Lakes Trail, but throughout the Northeast. Um, and it is native, but it's a native plant that actually does quite well amidst our human disturbance. Um, I often saw it on power line right-of-ways, gas line right-of-ways. Um, roadside embankments. So the reason for that is that it loves copious sun. Um, so we humans are pretty good at creating those sunny patches <laughs> by logging and clearing and development. Um, but if given an opportunity, sweet fern will happily just march right in and regreen the area. Um, and these leaves, they are honestly our tastiest uh, tea plant that you're going to find uh, here in the northeast. So these leaves, when they unfurl in spring um, and throughout, throughout the warm season, as long as they're green, you can just pinch those off the woody stalk and steep in hot or cold water. Um, they will also impart their flavoring to cold water. And you're going to have like a sweet, spicy sort of beverage. Um, very hard to describe. I just encourage you to try it for yourself. Um, but it's going to have a sort of chai or like English breakfast kind of taste to it. It's like a complex sort of black tea flavor. And the Native Americans considered this a blood cleanser. So a plant, again, that would enliven the body, circulate energy throughout the body. And it's also a helpful digestive aid, as well as a decongestant and expectorant. So sweet fern. Um, not only tasty, but medicinal. And here's a picture of what the leaves look like as they start to turn in autumn. So you would not want to use the upper leaf. You'd only want to use the, the younger leaves. But sometimes you will find both on the same plant. These were picked at the same time. And our final plant, um, it's actually a tree. So birch, Betula lenta, and Betula alleghaniensis. 
Now we have a number of different kinds of birch, white birch and gray birch, uh, paper birch, but uh, Betula lenta and Betula alleghaniensis, so your black birch, also known as cherry birch, also known as sweet birch, and your yellow birch, so I would just think of these as black and yellow birch, um, both contain high amounts of methyl salicylic acid. And methyl salicylic acid is a muscular analgesic and an anti-inflammatory. So think of this as like your aspirin tree. <laughs> um, even though aspirin was actually synthesized from salicylic acid in the willow tree, um, you can use this tree in the same way. So black birch is one of the most common trees you're gonna encounter. Um, it's often in successional forests. It's a dominant tree in successional forests. Um, for the reason that once an area is logged or cleared, um, black birch will happily germinate in full sun and the deer don't particularly care for it. Uh, so they'll eat all the other little saplings and give black birch the advantage. And, oh, sorry there. Um, and yet, Yellow birch is also, I mean, in fact, on the Finger Lakes Trail, I saw a ton of yellow birch. Yellow birch is that birch that likes to perch atop big boulders and reach its roots uh, uh, down into the soil, um, you know, kind of climbing down the sides of those boulders. If you've ever seen those. Um, but yellow birch uh, likes moist areas. Um, I tended to find it more often than not along streams and riverside and then of course in the higher elevations and like the Catskill region um, it's going to be one of the primary trees that you encounter just through the forest but there's a lot of precipitation there in the Catskills. Um, so whether you've got black or yellow birch your leaves are going to look just like what you see here. They're going to have tiny little teeth along the outer edge and they're going to grow in pairs. And to take a look at those teeth, it's really like each tooth is toothed. Um, so we say that black birch and yellow birch have doubly toothed leaves. Here's your barks. So black birch is gonna have gray smooth bark. Yellow birch is gonna have bronzy bark that is peeling in little shreds. And both of these birches have prominent lenticels, so these horizontal lines and, um, along the trunk, and those are the pores through which the tree exchanges gases. Um, lenticels are not all that prominent on other kinds of trees, so that's a little clue that you've got a birch. So what we can do with birch is simply just take the twigs, snap them off of a branch, break those twigs up into small pieces, and then steep or lightly simmer the twigs in hot water for a tea that is delicious. It has um, actually a minty sort of flavor. And as soon as you crack a twig, if you bring that twig to your nose, you're gonna smell mint. That's a major identifier for your birches. If you don't smell, um, if you don't smell mint, you don't have black or yellow birch. You may have a different birch, but you don't have black or yellow. Um, so that tea, again, great for muscular aches and pains after a hard day on the trail. This was certainly one of my go-tos while I was out there. Um, good for headaches, general soreness. And on a side note, this, uh, the black birch is the birch that has been tapped traditionally for its sap that was used in birch beer or root beer. Um, so your black birch is your root beer tree. They take that watery sap, they boil it down into a syrup, and then they would combine that with the tea of sassafras roots and wild sarsaparilla roots, and they ferment it. And that was our, our first birch beer, root beer. So that's the last of our plants. Um, I do have one more slide for you. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Um, so all the plants that we, uh, we talked about, that we went over tonight, are in uh, my plant guide, a guide to the edible and medicinal plants of the Finger Lakes Trail. 
And I know a number of you have, have already reached out to me, purchased the book. Thank you for that. Um, so if you want to dive deeper, there's about 40 plants in there with recipes and a color photo with each one and, and all those little nitty gritty details I went over about, you know, how to be certain you've got, got violet and not uh, monkshood, you know, a toxic plant. That's, that's all in there too. Um, and I'm also excited to announce, and y'all are actually the first, the first group I formally announced this to, um, that I have my third book coming out, um, likely at the end of May, early June, called Love and the Long Pass. And that is uh, the story of my fiance and I through hiking New York State's 358 mile Long Pass, which um, does connect to the Finger Lakes Trail. And actually, when I was hiking the Finger Lakes Trail, I was very close to, to just hopping on the Long Pass for a little bit, but but I was tired <laughs> after after nearly a thousand miles on on the Finger Lakes Trail. Um, but he and I hiked that trail in 2017 and um, had quite the adventure, lots of joys, lots of trials, and so many edible and medicinal plants too. So that is, those are woven into the book as well. So um, you can learn a thing or two about the plants while you're reading our love and adventure story at the same time. And um, both these books uh, are available on my website, which is www.thebotanicalhiker.com. Um, and although Love in the Long Path is not yet out in print, um, you can pre-order it. So there is a little button up there and I'll be keeping close track of, of those orders too. Well, thank you, Heather. We have a couple of questions that came in on the chat. I don't know if you were following those, but I'm gonna scroll back and just address at least a few of them. Yeah. First, early on, we had a bunch of people that, that welcomed and said hello from where they were and that was pretty cool. So hello everyone again. Um, we had a suggestion from Cindy Bailey. Oh, now everything moved around. Hold on. Oh, <laughs> I hope that wasn't me. The screen and all my stuff moved. Um, <laughs> Cindy Bailey suggested in one of the early slides about to dip the flowers in egg white and sugar and they last for cake decorations. So that was mm, really cool. Yeah, great um, idea. And Will Apollo mentioned also candied violets dipped in sugar wash. Uh, Will anything, this is from Willa Powell, will anything that cools a bug bite also ease, ease sunburn pain? Yes, absolutely. So um, your violet leaves, your chickweed, um, I think those are the two, two of the plants from our talk tonight that would work well. Also common plantain leaves, um, absolutely. So you could infuse those in like an olive oil and then apply that that infused oil to your sunburn um i just wouldn't use it on like a real oozy like intense sunburn like i'm talking you know sun kissed <laughs> but yes absolutely good for for moisturizing and cooling the burn um justin asks are there any plants that will run the risk of over harvesting or are all these so common we don't have to worry yeah awesome question so the let's think back here so the only plant that I would be concerned about over harvesting would be the ramps. And let me just look through my list to be certain that I'm, yeah, yeah, the ramps. Um, which I did chat some about, just being careful that you're only harvesting from a large patch and you're taking a very small amount. So. Um, the rule that I've always followed if I were harvesting for like, for medicine making, like if I were harvesting a larger quantity of plants would be to harvest no more than one third of the population um, in front of you. However, you know, really if we're harvesting for food or for like light medicinal use, you really shouldn't even need to harvest that much. You know, you're just pinching a little bit here and there. You are taking, only take what you need basically. Um, and, you know, be aware, which actually the book outlines too, you know, there are sometimes species, like species, there is actually a species of ramp that I have never encountered in New York State that is threatened. It's not the species that we chatted about 
Um, but you know, it's it's quite possible that you could come across a rare species of even say violet too. Um, so know what those rare species are and how to discern them from the species you have so that you are certain you aren't picking something that is endangered or rare. Um, and again, the book the book goes over all that, so that will that can help you out that way too. Yeah, and, is uh, a lot? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, one more note too. As far as using plants for food and medicine too, you always want to know exactly what plant you have at hand before you ingest it. Like you, you want to know, okay, this is not just a violet, this is viola canadensis or, you know, be pretty, be certain. Um, not only for the endangered plant aspect, but also for your own, your own safety. You know, you want to have a positive ID before you ingest. Um, Barbara asks, is phlox toxic? So I have never considered phlox an edible. Um, I assumed there was toxicity. However, I will tell you recently, I have heard of people eating phlox. I've, I've had a couple people on my walks who have mentioned, oh, I thought phlox was safe to eat. Um, and I have yet to look into it. So, um, do, do a little bit of research yourself and, and take a look-see. <laughs> uh, Eugene Binder uh, just gave a recommendation that Rochester has a mushroom club where you can learn about edible mushrooms. It's rochestermushroomclub.com. Okay. So just a tip for everybody. Um, I'm not sure what this one is referring to, leaves to, or just the flowers. I think it was somewhere in the, I'm not sure where it was, uh, <laughs> in the, within the, and we had some comments along the way, which I'll let people read. Um, just trying to pick out the questions. I apologize if I miss anything. Somebody asked, I'm not sure which one this was referring to, but it's probably a question for all of them. Would you need to steep leaves twice to make tea once just to get rid of the oils? No, no. Um, Typically the rule is if you're working with leaves or flowers or stems, things that are herbaceous, you steep. So you could steep for anywhere from, you know, five minutes if you're just going for flavor or 10 to 20 minutes if you're going for medicinal purposes. If you're working with barks or twigs or roots or seeds, nuts, things that are hard and woody, then you're going to simmer those to really get in there and extract um, the medicinal aspects as well as the full flavor. So that's, that's like the general rule. Um, there's a long message in here, which I'm gonna let somebody else read, but somebody looking for expert advice. So if you wanna read that and perhaps help her out. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna scroll on through. Fruit of wild grapes, sometimes called jewelberry. I don't know what that means. Hmm, not that I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of, but that's where our common names get tricky. That's why I love giving folks scientific names because common names can really, you know, be confusing depending on what region you're from. Willa asks, uh, what about river birch or paper birch? Are they also edible? So to the best of my knowledge, there are no toxic birches, um, but I have never used either of those. I have not used river birch medicinally. Paper birch would be, I know that would be safe. Um, I have never used river birch, but neither of those would contain large quantities of the methyl salicylic acid. The paper birch would have an antifungal quality that um, the black and yellow birch would not have. Uh, Roger Hopkins asks, Heather, what is your background? <laughs> hey, Roger. <laughs> Roger was one of my magical trail angels on the trail. <laughs> um, so what is my background? So I am an herbalist, a certified herbalist. I got my certificate from the, the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine and in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and I would certainly recommend that program to anybody. I will say now it's, it's online. So when I went, it was hands-on, um, but she's got a wealth of, uh, great video tutorials and, and blogs and things of that sort. Um, and I have just walked with a whole lot of experts and done a whole lot of study myself. Honestly, you know, writing these books, the FLT book was my 
was my second plant guide that I wrote. Um, you, you got to be sure you've got your facts right, you know, so you are studying up and you're reading everything you can get your hands on and um, spending time in the woods too, uh, interacting with the plants. That's a great teacher. Well, after that, there's just a whole bunch of thanks and kudos to you. Good presentation. Oh. Oh. Everyone enjoyed <laughs> it. Um, if anybody wants to unmute and ask any questions, feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, we'll just say thank you for joining us and thank you, Heather. And I, I know for me personally, this has really sort of enriched my experience of the FLT and I'm going to be checking things out differently and using your book. I'm really excited. Uh, awesome. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, I guess one last thing I would say too is um, I had some folks reach out to me before the talk. They found me on my website said, hey, I'd love to do a walk with you or I'd love to learn from you. Um, I do do, uh, that's, that's what I do for a living. I do guided uh, walks, plant walks, herbal seminars. So um, I still have those coming up this summer and I do offer them in the Finger Lakes region. So if you tune into my, um, my schedule at my website or my Facebook at The Botanical Hiker, you can keep up to date on when those things are happening. Um, or if you have an idea for a walk or a talk, um, I'm available. Awesome. Yeah. So who's this cool looking dog here that I'm seeing? Uh, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> you want to say? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> hey, <laughs> no, that's my husband, Steve. Um, uh, he's a veterinarian, so he put our dog. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we really enjoyed your talk. That was Very so nice. great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. Absolutely. We're, we're going to call you for a walk. <laughs> oh, cool. Please do. Please do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> sweet. All right, I'm going to go now. <laughs> I'm trying to. And our Great, I'm getting to see everyone's face now. <laughs> <laughs>